everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Mike Wilkos. He's a precious community resource, master of tons of valuable data, which he helps put to use to benefit our community. Uh, formerly at the Columbus Foundation and currently at United Way. His heart is big and uh, real big, actually, and uh, symbolized by all that professional work. And on his own, he uh, is a resident of Wineland Park and has spent years and years there helping that community regrow. So, my pleasure, Michael Wilkos, hopefully on screen. So today I'm going to talk about several things. We've had lots of changes in this community over the last year. And I just want to say that this presentation, which is about our city and how the place that you live determines how you live and how structural racism really plays a part. I have been a student of and a practitioner of race and uh, social equity for 35 years. And the last year I have come to the realization is that I, is, I am not as far advanced as I thought. Uh, and so I want to share with you some of that journey and give us to a common understanding of the city that we now share. This is where I grew up my entire life. I grew up in a neighborhood with 350 houses. All 350 were homeowners and all 350 were white. At 18 years old, I never really thought about why my neighborhood looked the way it was, but I need to come to this acknowledgement that I am a beneficiary of segregation. I am a beneficiary of racism. I moved to Columbus and at 21 years old, I get a job renting apartments, 20 hours a week, Monday through Friday, 10 hours on the weekend. And I'm told a few things by the folks I work with. The apartment complex is at around Morrison Westerville Road. It's about 60% white, 40% black. I come to Columbus from suburban Youngstown thinking that I've come to a very open-minded, very progressive city. I'm told the following. When I'm assigning applicants to vacant units, please don't put a person of color near the rental office. So when white customers come onto the property, they think the property is more white than what it is. I'm also told that if a person of color is applying for an apartment, I'm to put a little tick mark on the application, letting the home office, which manages thousands of units in Columbus, to know the race of the applicants. At 21 years old, this didn't feel right. I didn't know it was illegal. I called downtown to the HUD office, told them what my employer was telling me to do, and they asked me if I would keep a log of all of the times I was instructed to do things. As a 21-year-old undergraduate at Ohio State, that experience really changed my trajectory of what I do today. In reading uh, lots of books over the last year, one would be Robin DiAngelo and White Fragility and how she talks about how early neighborhoods are socially organized through this lens of race. How do we get these messages that white people were better? And she said, consider how we talk about white neighborhoods. We do it all the time. White neighborhoods are good and safe and clean and desirable. And then we talk about other neighborhoods, right? Like Linden, and we call them dangerous and crime ridden places to be avoided. And she goes on in the book to say, she can tell you whether or not a neighborhood is becoming more white or more diverse based on whether or not that neighborhood is appreciating faster or slower than the median for that neighborhood. Race is encoded in geography and in everything that we do. This is where I live now. As Rick said, I live in Wineland Park. I'm living on the same street I started on 31 years ago as a college student. I now own a home on that street and it is a mixed race, mixed income neighborhood. I'm also a gentrifier. If you reduce me to census checkbox of my age and income and employment status, and I have to be aware that there are unintended consequences of the pride that I have that I live in a mixed race and mixed income neighborhood. I share this to say, we all have a part that we play in this and none of us are have a greater standing than others whether or not we live in a homogeneous neighborhood like the one I grew up in, or if we live in a diverse community like I do now. Again, back to white fragility. She talks about things about neighborhoods. If people of color don't live in your neighborhood, why don't they? And where do people of color live? And when you were young, were you encouraged to visit these neighborhoods? Because I certainly, as a young person growing up in Youngstown, was told very clear messages from my parents and others about where I should or should not go. And then recently, I finished reading Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and you can read the quote here. 
I used to think that I was not racist. He believes that you are either participating in racist activities or you are working to be an anti-racist. What I have come to the realization that in parts of my day, I am working to dismantle racism. And then minutes later, I am participating in racist systems that I was unaware that they are racist activities. What he further goes on to say is that the term racist is not a pejorative. It's not the equivalent of a slur, it is descriptive. And the only way for us to undo racism, racism is to consistently identify and describe it. And that we use these terms and call somebody or something racist, it freezes us into inaction. I, am I have accepted this definition and I have been trying to apply this definition to everything I do in my personal and professional life. And to be honest, I have struggled over the last year with this journey, but I'm glad I'm on it. So the thing about Columbus is we're rapidly growing. The rest of the state of Ohio is not. And so there are forces at work here that are driving neighborhood change that I'm gonna share with you. The percentage of where the growth in our metropolitan region is happening has dramatically shifted this decade. It has come inward, it has come into Franklin County, and it is putting huge housing pressures and demographic shifts in Franklin County neighborhoods. And we see things like this. These are projects going up behind COSI in Franklinton, or projects on East Long or North 4th Street or West Broad Street. We also see huge projects going on in the suburbs, the scale of which we haven't seen before. But the reality is growth and prosperity are not the same thing. We see all this construction and there's an impression many people have that Columbus is doing great. The reality is this economic recovery over the last decade has behaved unlike any other in modern times. The red dot shows the unemployment rate the yellow bars are the number of people who are economically vulnerable, those that live at 200% of federal poverty. It dramatically skyrocketed in the financial collapse of 2008 to 2010, and every recession recovery, recession recovery has behaved in the same way until this one, which means when we begin to create jobs and the unemployment rate goes down, you would begin to see those yellow bars, the number of people who are economically vulnerable should also begin to drop it has not been dropping. And I'm gonna oversimplify the Columbus and the national economy. For 35% of us in this community with college degrees, the economy's working great. For the other 35%, plumbers, electricians, construction workers, building all that stuff that you see, they're also doing great. There's about 30% of the workforce, 400,000 people in Franklin County, they're working, most of which are working full time. They do not have enough income to meet basic needs. This is a new normal of the American economy. Way before COVID, things were not working right in this country for about a third of the population. And for our region, we are now a more economically vulnerable city and region than before this population spurt that we've just gone through. That in the year 2000, 32% of the city of Columbus could be served by United Way funded program. The city of Columbus skyrockets in population by 171,000 people, but the percentage of people who are economically vulnerable goes from 32 to 40%. What that means is that 70% of the net population growth of our city the last nearly 20 years have been people who are economically struggling. And we're growing. If the rate of this continues by 2030, there will be 70,000 more economically vulnerable people living in Franklin County. And I will ask you in a, in a, um, a rhetorical way, take out the map of Franklin County and tell me where you wanna put 70,000 more economically vulnerable people, because we as a nation and a community are not building the volume of affordable housing to accommodate that growth. And I'm gonna be very direct about it. There will need to be additional neighborhoods in our city that will have to fall to economic vulnerability in order to accommodate this population growth. It is the unintended consequence of a growing region. It means we will also have more people who are poor. And we've been chronically underbuilding. It looks like there's a lot of construction, but we have been underbuilding every year for a decade, about five to 6,000 units short of supply. 2020 was the 
most number of units built in central Ohio in 15 years, and it was still 3,000 units short of what we needed last year just to accommodate that growth. That means we now have a critical scarcity of available housing. The Board of Realtors has just reported that we have the lowest inventory ever, and the rental vacancy rate has recorded some of the lowest marks since 1970. Across the board, home buyers and renters at every income ban are struggling to find product. So let's talk about gentrification and displacement. They are different things. They're both happening, but are not happening the way people think. Gentrification is the arrival of wealthy people in existing areas. They have huge increases in rents and property values, and they also change a district's uh, character and culture. This is a widespread problem in Seattle and Denver and Austin and DC. It is not a widespread problem in Columbus to the degree that people think. We're gonna walk through that. A tool was created by the Institute of Economic Opportunity out of the Law School of Minnesota, and here's the map they came up with for our region. This was 2000 through 2016. We'll talk about what's happening in the last couple of years because it has shifted. In a 16 year period, everywhere on this map that's in red or peach shows areas of Franklin County that got poorer during those 16 years. The areas in blue got significantly wealthier or experienced gentrification. If you don't see color on the map, Upper Arlington, or maybe the Near East Side, that means it was wealthy in 2000, still wealthy in 2016, or it was low income and still low income. Lots of change going on, but there are 10 times the number of neighborhoods getting poorer than the number of neighborhoods getting wealthier, because if our region is becoming more economically vulnerable as it grows, there can't be a massive gentrification issue. Is there a problem in certain neighborhoods? You bet. Let's focus into Northland. Huge area of our city, massive increase in economic vulnerability. You can scan down the chart on the left. I do wanna point out that in 16 years, 16,387 white people left Northland and 16,473 African-American or black moved in while there was a huge increase in new Americans at the same time. Northland is the poster child for the suburbanization of poverty as poverty is moving in a rapid way further away from downtown Columbus. When you zoom into the core of Northland, look at those blue bars. In 2000, the core of Northland at Morrison Carl, 41% of those people living there were economically vulnerable. By 2016, it was 73%, right? And for 50 years, Columbus had a predictable pattern in Linden and the Hilltop and Parsons Avenue. When neighborhoods got poorer, middle-class people picked up and moved out, which left these neighborhoods to be predominantly uh, poor, but they were losing population. We now, for the first time, are recording Columbus neighborhoods that as they're getting poorer, are growing in population because the core of Northland jumped 13% in population, but it's not building housing units. How are Columbus neighborhoods growing in population while not adding housing? Because someone like me as a single person might have lived in a two bedroom apartment. I pick up and move out and a family of five from Bhutan replaces me. They are economically vulnerable. Neighborhoods are increasing in population, not adding housing units and they're getting poorer and they're suburbanizing. So we might say, let's all rush off to Northland. And I say, hold on. Because if you look at Linden, which doesn't show up as very colorful on the map, because their increase wasn't as dramatic as Northland. But even in Linden, the number of people who are economically vulnerable, Linden also got poorer. It's just that the percentage of Linden that was already poor was higher. In the case of Northland, it went from being more economically prosperous than Columbus as a city in 2000 to being more economically vulnerable in just 16 years. So we've got this huge shell game going on around our city that we are reacting to. I want to be clear, home prices and rents are going up in Northland as well, not because rich people are moving into Northland, but because more and more low income people are competing against each other for a finite supply. That's why our chronic underbuilding is hurting everybody, but it's really putting a squeeze on low and moderate income housing consumers. So now we'll talk about opportunity. This was a tool created by Ohio State more than a decade ago. I love it. It encapsulates huge amounts of data in one image. 17 different indicators in four broad categories. You can collect this data regularly and you can map it and it is through dependable secondary data sets. Here's the map. The map on the left is the county, the map on the right, urban Columbus. 
the darker the color, the greater the level of opportunity. And what OSU's Kerwin Institute suggests is where you are born and where you continue to live are some of the highest contributing factors to your life's outcomes. Geography matters and it matters in ways where we're fully understanding. If you look at the map on the right, you can find this very clear line. That's Parsons Avenue between German Village, Marion Village and Schumacher Place. Here's Bexley. There's Linden, and that's that railroad track that runs along Interstate 71 running north, which you're going to see over and over and over in all these maps. Place matters. So does race. The map on the left is the Asian population. The map on the right is the white population. Each dot is sized according to the size of that racial group in that geography. If you look at the map on the right, 70% of white people in Franklin County live in the highest opportunity neighborhoods, which is why a lot of times mainstream society doesn't really understand the issues around violence and lack of economic opportunity in parts of Franklin County. When you continue and look at the Hispanic population on the left and the black population on the right, it's the reverse for the black population. 70% of black and African-American residents in Franklin County live in the lowest opportunity census tracts, which means children by age five growing up in those areas in low, pale yellow in concentrated poverty are already one and a half years behind their middle-class counterparts in their academic achievement, which often means children of color may never catch up with their middle-class counterparts. And I'm gonna show that to you on a series of maps that are longitudinal over time because family income is one of the strongest predictors to measure success both in the classroom and in economic, to, uh, economic opportunity later in life. And here's that map. This is a map that measures the net wealth of 15 to 24 year olds in this community. If you look at the five highest tracks and the five lowest tracks, south of Lane Avenue in Upper Arlington, 15 to 24 year olds are already starting their career trajectory with $574,000 in net wealth, while children in Franklinton, young people, I should say young adults, are starting with $8,000. Income inequality in Franklin County begins at 72 times one. Go 40 years out, income inequality goes from 72 to one to 252 to one. And you continue to see wealth begets wealth as you see uh, both census tracts in Upper Arlington, Worthington and Bexley are jumping in the 2.7 to 3.1 million for that last decade before retirement and yet the net wealth of people heading into retirement on the Near East Side in East Franklinton or my neighborhood of Wineland Park has barely budged. The challenge in contemporary American society is not about how much wealth there is, it really is about how that wealth is distributed by individuals and how it is layered through geography and then compounded by structural and historical racism uh, through uh, a race equity lens. I love this quote from Jonathan Kozel, who says an awful lot of people come to college with this strange idea that there's no longer segregation in America's schools, that our schools are basically equal. If you look at the academic outcome of, say, Upper Arlington and Grandview, and you compare that to some of those Columbus City schools, it is not the fault of a five-year-old kid who is already showing up in their child care experience one and a half years behind those upper middle class children who have never been able to make up. And then when you look at the disproportionality of enrollment at The Ohio State University, which is only 5.5% African American, while the state of Ohio is 12.5% and Franklin County is 23%, there is a massive racial equity lens. We have to start applying to everything that we do. And so, Look at the history of our evolution of our cities. The highway building project rips through Linden and Milo Grogan. Linden, which was a separate suburb annexed into Columbus's Linden Heights for water, was predominantly a middle class community. Then you get the highway building. Here's the picture of uh, basically Hudson in 71 that ripped through Linden, essentially where the Map Free Stadium now is. And shortly after we had the highway, here comes busing. In a single year, half of the white children left Lyndon McKinley High School because of the concerns of what busing was going to do. And you can see this chart of what happened in the years between when the Supreme Court case was filed, when it was litigated, when the decision was made to do busing, 37,000 children left the Columbus School District in seven academic seasons. Most of those were white. Many of them picked up and moved further out, but because of annexation, stayed in the city of Columbus, but now fell into those suburban school districts. 
And because between 1955 and 1985, as the city was annexing land, it wasn't changing its school district boundaries, which meant most of that land getting annexed into Columbus was going to what? Multifamily housing or commercial development and the upper middle class suburban home builders had leapfrogged out of the Columbus school district to, get to go into those suburban districts. And in Linden, this was very controversial and it resulted in a lot of violence, including the fact that Columbus police and Columbus city schools decided to close Linden McKinley High School for fear of violence. And in this 1980 cover story from Columbus Monthly that focused on white police officers shooting and killing unarmed black youth in Columbus, it further goes on to say that police officers have difficulty driving through the Neary side in the university district during the day without getting their cars pelted by rocks and bottles because the Columbus police has such a difficult community relations problem. It further went on to say, uh, Columbus Bar Association did a review of Columbus police behavior, and the quote is something like this. Columbus police should be able to subdue a suspect without beating that person into subconsciousness with a club or stick, and that the Columbus police are using fear and intimidation in certain parts of Columbus and with certain communities to instill fear. That was a 1949 Columbus Bar Association assessment of the Columbus Police Department. Yesterday, we approved a new citizens review panel. This is 72 years of published reports that have identified a culture system, which is why in my opinion, things are so difficult to change when we're talking about systems. And that leads us to a quick history lesson. There were three kinds of ways we organized American cities, racial zoning, expulsive zoning, we don't want factories next to houses, and exclusionary, we don't want poor people next to rich people. Here's the crash course. We were doing racial zoning, it was a public tool. This is from the Baltimore plan, which was the most egregious example of racialized zoning where they wanted to quarantine black people so they didn't give white people communicable diseases and the courts struck this down seven years after these tools started to be deployed in the united states undeterred because of american culture the laws changed the behavior didn't which is why we started to deploy racially restrictive covenants in the private sector and everybody did it Every city did it, Columbus did it, and the suburbs did it, but 70% of all subdivisions that were platted in this community uh, had these common exclusions, which would not let certain people live in those communities. And so you had the HOLC assessment, Homeowners Loan Corporation. They employed people to walk neighborhoods and they did two things. They looked at the physical conditions of the built environment, is there storm sewage? Is there peeling paint? Is there obnoxious uses next door? But also the social conditions of who lives there. Either of those would allow that HOLC assessor to turn something into a bank or an insurance company that would say, this neighborhood is not worthy of your insurance or bank loans based on either the people who live there or the quality of the built environment. We'll focus on the social conditions. And here are our examples. These are quotes from the HOLC assessment book done in Columbus where entire neighborhoods were written off. They were deemed hazardous because of those conditions. The colored section of Flytown, which is the entire area near Harrison West that was bulldozed in the 1950s. They also did it for the Near East Side. This was the colored business section along East Long Street. Look at the quality of that built environment. 85 years ago, the failure of the Near East Side was codified in those HOLC assessment tools. It also was done on the South Side because whether you were Jewish, Italian, Black, or a foreigner, you were deemed a hazardous individual to whites. And so here's a couple quotes pulled from an HOLC assessment card from different cities. Just four Black families on a single street or 5% of a neighborhood was considered um, uh, of Negro descent the entire neighborhood would be written off. And this is the map that they created. Everything in pink was hazardous, in yellow was rapidly declining, in green, Bexley, Grandview, Arlington, Clintonville was tier one, and they were deemed high, uh, high credibility that they would continue to be strong places to live. 
in a recent study that looked at from 1980, after the federal laws changed, they looked at the exact same housing typology. Think of Grandview and Driving Park and Westgate and Homes in Linden or Kenlon Park, often built by the same builder, the same architect, even though the barriers and the, were removed and the laws were changed, people living in those green areas have appreciated $200,000 more in equity on the exact same built environment because of these HOLC assessments that were done over 80 years ago. And then in Arlington specifically, much of Arlington was owned by a man of color, Pleasant Litchford. And in fact, not only were these black laws still on the books, and he had to pay the equivalent of a $15,000 fee to basically live in the area of Upper Arlington. This is no judgment of Upper Arlington. These were all over the state. He also had to have a sign affidavit from two white people that would say if he caused problems in that neighborhood, those white residents would be responsible for his behavior. When Pleasant Litchford sold that land, and by the way, the title of the book is because black people couldn't be buried in white cemeteries, and often these family plots, the tombstones would be removed, the bodies were not, and in August of last year, Upper Arlington just removed, exhumed six bodies from the Upper Arlington School Complex that were never removed uh, a long time ago. And so, when that land was sold in Upper Arlington to King Thompson, restrictive covenants were put in for the thousand acres and look at that marketing brochure for Upper Arlington, a thousand acres restricted, meaning restricted to people of color who were not allowed to ever buy property south of Lane Avenue. And yet, in 1970, the Upper Arlington Northwest Homeowners Association had organized to circumvent federal laws. They bought a home out from under a black MD from New Jersey who was moving to Upper Arlington. They prevented him from buying the home, flipped the home to King Thompson. The man that led the work was also on the Ohio Real Estate Commission. They were finally found guilty in a court of law in 1970 for violating those uh, federal laws in Arlington. What's interesting, if you now take a look at Upper Arlington today, there are 35,299 people, only 105 of which are Black. Upper Arlington is the least racially diverse place in the entire metropolitan region. Why would that be? Because Upper Arlington was built with restrictive covenants when there were laws that prevented people of color from living there, and then there were people who organized to circumvent those federal laws. Interestingly enough, the only community wealthier than Upper Arlington, which is New Albany, is much more diverse, mainly because New Albany wasn't built during the era of restrictive covenants. It never had a homeowners association that tried to prevent people of color. And more importantly, if you look at the mobility of the black population of this region, which really started on the near east side and toward Milo Grogan, and in these 20 year increments, you could see how quickly the African American population has a, a, moved both northeast and east and again you can clearly see this railroad track that runs along interstate 71. so not only does new albany not have the history new albany is within the trajectory of where the upper middle class um, black home buyer is migrating the question we must ask ourselves in 2021 there are thousands of black home buyers who can afford 750 thousand dollars and 1.5 million dollar homes why is it that when the barriers are removed in places like Arlington, do those home buyers avoid those kinds of communities? I believe history matters. It matters in very complex ways, and we have to start deconstructing that. We had all these tools that came during the post-World War II era to uh, create both growth in the suburbs and the demise of central cities. The reality is all of those tools 99% of all of the federal post-World War II subsidies that created the suburbs went to white households. Even black veterans had a hard time accessing these tools that were designed by our government to assist folks. Further, you had highway building, you had the redlining, that's the intersection of Parsons and Livingston. Look at the evolution of that intersection in just 14 years. It ripped the neighborhood in half. It started whole scale demolition. At the same time that highway was opening up land on Columbus's urban periphery, it was only opening that land to white buyers as it was eliminating housing options for black residents in the core of the city. 
And now we have those same impacts of chronic disease and life expectancy, just like that opportunity map I showed you that are still impacting those neighborhoods today, like the Hilltop, like London, like the Near East Side. Yeah. So I, I know you could go on and on. This is, I'm right. this is it, I'm at the end. Okay, so we'd like to try to wrap it up and do have a, a little bit of time for some Q&A. Yeah, this is it. So here we have the redlining map from 1935. The map on the right is the foreclosure map. The foreclosure map of 2006 was the same neighborhoods that you saw in the 1930s. And here you had the Kerwin Institute, which did a 2010 map on the right of where while the government stopped doing the predatory loans, the map on the right shows the private sector, the buy here, pay here, the check cashing places. It's the same neighborhoods as the 1935 map. And you can see it through all of these maps. Here's the map of infant mortality. Here's the map of uh, high red is high opportunity, pale yellow is low opportunity. This is where every shooter or victim was a youth in this community. There's a direct correlation between the economic stability of the parents and where youth gun violence is happening. This is legal aid society caseload. Most of this is evictions. It's the same neighborhoods that were redlined. Here you have where people lived right before they went to jail and food pantry use and food insecurity by the Mid-Ohio Food Collective. And it all ends in this. This is a life expectancy map of Franklin County. There's a 21 year difference in life expectancy in Franklin County. In the dark red, people will die 20 years sooner than people who live and continue, were born and continue to live in the dark blue. It is not one solution. It is chronic disease management. It's infant mortality. It is domestic violence. Uh, it's healthcare access. It's all of these things, which is why the solutions will not be quick and they will not be easy. So thank you, I had to wrap that up quickly. The reality is there, are, we all recognize that there are these uh, theoretic inequalities in our society, but most people draw the line when they're asked to do something in their own community and their own neighborhood. And I just leave you with a rhetorical question. What are you willing to do in your personal and professional life in the neighborhood you live to move toward a stronger equity agenda? So I thank you for the opportunity. I had a lot of stuff to share and I will leave all of these, uh, the slide deck with Scott and Rick. So you will have access to all of the maps and all of the data that you can look through at your convenience. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Great detail. All right, so I wanna start with questions in the room first. Nancy. Um, as a service organization, uh, Rotary, what is the best use of our, our energy and funds against the violence that's occurring within Columbus with the youth? So Michael, could you hear that at all? I uh, know, could you just repeat it real quickly? Right. Sure, so as a service organization in Columbus, what can, we, what can we best do with our energy and resources to help against the violence that's happening in our community? You know, um, the, the, the violence is, is, is complicated, right? I mean, there's all kinds of work we should be doing around providing um, economic opportunity, about providing employment, about providing both mentorship uh, and access for youth in those communities. I mean, the reality is this. What we now know over the last 12 months is that when the schools were closed and the rec centers were closed and the, uh, you know, the boys and girls clubs and the drop-in centers were closed, what did we see? A huge increase in gun violence and assaults. We saw a huge drop in that age. But you know, the violence in uh, core urban neighborhoods, this is not something new. It just became exacerbated by all of this. But you can be advocates for things around social justice. One quick example that I'm very proud of in this community that Bexley was the first to do a source of income protection, followed by uh, Westerville, Reynoldsburg, and Columbus have all passed in the last five months source of income protection, which means anybody with child support, alimony, social security disability, or you know traditional Section 8 support can no longer be denied access to high quality neighborhoods. So people who have those income sources have a choice to live where they want. Regardless of where you live, you can be advocating for housing choice and housing policy that really open up Columbus neighborhoods. So those families who struggle can live in better neighborhoods. I know Steve Heiser is involved in the move to prosper work, which is really about giving people the opportunity to live in higher quality neighborhoods. 
low income people should not have to be forced to live in neighborhoods where they have to wait for 20 years for those revitalization efforts to turn around. That's a, it's complicated, but on a personal level, it's the mentoring and as an organization, you can be doing advocacy for some of these things like source of income protections for every community in Franklin County. Mike, I'll step up there. Go ahead and tell me. I want, no, I want to know, you know, we as Rotary are not Bexley, we're not Worthington, we're not As a service Huntington. group, we're not a city, we're not a municipality. We what is a service organization? A what can we do? How can we move forward? And if you can't answer that right this moment, in this that's moment, okay. That's but, okay. Yeah. We'd like an answer. Right. I mean, I, you know, I would certainly will give that some thought, right? Like I, I'm not in your DNA, so I'm not sure like kind of what your appetite is. What I know about Rotary is that you are thoughtful, caring people. And I know the work that you've done around supporting, uh, you know, kids in Columbus City Schools has been really important. But you are all people who have access to middle class constructs. And the reality is a lot of the kids who are struggling or kids that are caught up in violence, they don't they don't have opportunity to spend time with people like you to understand those hidden rules of class, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things when I read the Bridges Out of Poverty work, it's like, you know, you make thousands of decisions every day unconsciously, right? So if you're poor and you look at food, the first reaction is, is there enough? For us middle-class folks, it, does it taste good? If you're wealthy, it's like, is it presented well? Whether it's money or food or relationships, um, as middle class individuals and as a service organization, you can be leaders and make those connections with kids who struggle, like whether or not you're adopting a, a particular Boys and Girls Clubs chapter or you as individuals are going to spend that time with kids in that center. I think that could be uh, significant on a both uh, organizational level and a personal level. And I look to some of you in the audience to make suggestions because you know your organization better than me. Thanks, Michael. So I'm going to have one more question from Tom Carlisi. Tom. Thank you. Um, a quick comment. I put in the uh, chat, I would love to see uh, the Rotary four-way test integrated into some of the policies and practices with some of the leadership organizations like Michael's part of. And if we all asked, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all? You have Rotarians that are in leadership positions in every sector of the, uh, our community. And if we integrated that, that may be a practice that could have some doable, doable pieces, in, including integrated into the young people, the schools and after school programs, et cetera. Something to think about. Okay. Thanks, Tom. There was also a comment in the in the chat about public transportation. I know you are a service organization, but I think your voice really matters. So when it comes to Columbus Rotary actually taking a stand and having a voice on things like expanding public transportation or policies that support economic justice, you know, our community is going to get $450 million in uh, American Rescue Funds, how that money gets deployed is going to be really critical. And I know all of you have experiences and work in professions, and I would like to see you take an, advo an advocacy role in making suggestions on how you think that money should be uh, deployed and how you could be participants in that. Great. Well, Michael, we want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for all the hard work you do in the community. Uh, we, I promise that you know our Rotary Club will continue to do the work that we are. We've uh, adopted the Windsor STEM Academy. We're trying to do more work in the Linden community. Uh, Columbus is a huge uh, community, and so we've got to kind of pick an area at a time and focus and have some impact, make some impact. And uh, so we know it's a long-term effort, like you said today. It's not going away. It's been here for a long time, and this is going to take continued effort. Our club's 100 and nine years old now and so over the next 109 years hopefully we can make that impact and make a difference so appreciate your time again thank you so much yep, thank you so much well, i want to thank you for joining us today it was great to see everybody in person hi jackie i didn't even see you come in hey dwight good to see you guys uh great to see everybody in person we're going to try to have another in-person meeting in May and another one in June, and then hopefully maybe by July under Amanda's uh, 
administration and tutelage, we will uh, we will uh, we'll be back to full time in person. So that's our goal, right? So we're continuing to work on that. But uh, everybody, have a great rest of your week. Everybody online, good to see you as well. I see we had 24 online plus about 50 in the room, so about 75 today. So uh, very good. Have a great week, and we are adjourned.